All right, Mr. Sneddon, go ahead. Mr. Dietz, I placed in front of you the document that's in evidence. That's 853, all right? And does that document have or bear an invoice number? Yes, it does. What is that invoice number? 0143505. And the amount of money that's indicated on that invoice number is what? $6,644. For four tickets? Correct. I'm going to place on the Elmo, Your Honor, if I might have it for just a moment, page 6 of Exhibit 855. No, the other one. Back. Back. There. All right. The information contained on page 6 of Exhibit 855 has the date in the far left-hand corner, is that correct? Correct. And moving down the date to March 1, 2003, in the second column over, what does the number 143,505 refer to? The invoice number. And with regard? Excuse me. To the far right-hand side of the exhibit at the top, it bears the word, fair, correct, F-A-R-E? Yes. And with regard to the flight on invoice number 143,505, you billed $1,661, correct? Yes. Is the invoice number and trip reflected on page 6 of the exhibit 855 the same trip that's represented by the invoice number on 853? You got me there. Where is 855? 853, the one in your hands. 855 is the one on the board. Okay. Is that the same trip? That is the same trip, but the invoice was, the ticket was issued the weekend. It was changed over the weekend, or reservations were cancelled. Flights were issued, e-tickets were issued. Three of the passengers did not travel. So this? On this itinerary. Okay. So 855 reflects the fact that only one person traveled on that itinerary that's been marked as 853 that's in your hand, correct? Correct. I couldn't hear you. Correct. All right, no further questions. Can I have the exhibits, please? I was going to put them back together again. If you want to have them, here. Why don't we keep them out for now, please? The rest of them are up there. May I approach to retrieve the exhibits? Yes. I'm just a little concerned, Your Honor. Mr. Sneddon said he was going to put them back together, so I think I will give them to Mr. Sneddon so they get in the right position there. They're all in order except for the one that was taken away from me. All right, there it is. All right, first of all, on, with regard to these summaries you just saw up on the board, particularly you took a look at one of the pages, I think it was page 6, and it showed the amount that was billed, and it showed it was billed for one person to travel, right? Yes. Say a word so the court reporter can get it down. Sorry. That's okay. You are assuming that that record was accurately placed into the computer database by whoever entered these things, is that correct? Correct. All right, and you noted from the other actual tickets that it appeared that three of the tickets, the ones for the Casios, I believe, were voided? Yes. Okay, there was the Casios and Le Peruque, correct? Yes. They were voided. You look at that, and you pretty much figure, well, as far as your company was concerned, the person that traveled on that particular day was Mr. Jackson? I would not necessarily assume that. Okay, I was going to ask you how you would come to that conclusion. So you're saying you don't know that? Correct. All right, now, I want to show you, you have the book in front of you there. Yeah. With the exhibits in the 200 series. And I'd ask you to turn to exhibit 223, and I believe that that is a two-page exhibit, is that correct? Yes, it is. All right, and, your honor, with the court's permission, I would like to put the copy I was given of those two pages up on the, on the board, if I may. Okay. Or up on the machine. And I'm going to show you the first page of exhibit, the 223. And that's already been up there before, but I'll ask you to look at that again. And this appears to be an itinerary that was generated somehow, correct? Yes. That's not your usual format for itineraries that are generated, is it? For itineraries, I believe it is. Okay, all the other itineraries that you have shown for exhibits 224 through 249 are generated on letterhead, with a different font, in a different format. Isn't that correct? 
yes, they're associated with an invoice. All right. Now, this particular one was not associated with an invoice because it was not sent. An invoice was not sent for payment on this flight. Is that correct? I cannot tell from what I see here. All right. Do you know whether or not that flight took place? I do not know. All right. And ordinarily when flights are booked through your agency by MJJ Productions, who is it that contacts you to book the flights? Evie. All right. And I'll tell you what. I'm going to ask you to just turn around and look this way, and I'll direct your attention to the board in a second when we put the next one up, but it's hard for everybody to hear you. Okay. So Evi Tavashi is ordinarily the person who would be contacting your agency, correct? Yes. All right, and she contacts your agency not just for Mr. Jackson's travel arrangements, but for other employees of MJJ Productions, correct? Definitely. Okay, and to your knowledge, if some other employee of MJJ Productions needs to travel for some business-related purpose, they would contact her, and she would in turn contact you, is that correct? Yes. When you make a flight arrangement for Evi Tavashi, or at her, at her request, do you fax a confirmation? I'm not sure. I don't know our daily practices. You're not the person that actually does it? Not at all. You just own the place? Yes. There you go. All right. Well, let me show you this anyway and see if this is. This is the second page I'm going to put up of this exhibit, and I'd like you to read the top. No, I'm kidding. Laughter. I'd like you just to look down at the bottom there. There's a TX result report. Yes. Is that a fax report? Yes, it is. Now, I am going to focus in on that a little bit more here. Give you a fair chance. Do you recognize the telephone or the fax number that that was sent to as being a fax number associated with anybody? I do not. Okay, and it appears that this fax, just go a little wider there. The result on the right is that it did not go through. It's ing, correct? That's what it looks like to me. And it says, redial, all failed, right? That's what it looks like to me. Now, your business has regular communications. During this period of time, your business had regular communications with Evi Tavashi, correct? Yes. And you had a good fax number for her, correct? Yes. Is there any indication in these two documents, and you can actually look at the documents in front of you, since I just have a copy here. Okay. If you look at these two documents that are marked as 223, is there any way to determine the time of day on February 5th that these tickets were requested? Requested? Yes. No, prior to 11.31. You know it's prior to 11.31, because that's when the fax first was attempted, the fax that didn't work, correct? That's correct. And ordinarily, your people would be pretty prompt if they were setting up a ticket for the same day. And I believe this is a ticket for the same day, right? You can take a look at your... Yes, it looks like that way. Yes, for a flight at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. The flight was to depart at 2 o'clock in the afternoon of February the 5th? Correct. So if somebody were doing this and faxing it out at 11.51 in the morning, they probably had made the arrangements very shortly before that, is that correct? That is correct. All right, now, the fact that on the top of, you keep looking at what you're looking at there. They didn't necessarily make the reservation at the time they called it in. I mean, on this day. They could have, they could have made the reservation prior to this date. Okay. If that's the question. Well, that's fair enough. You look, well, you're looking at your copy there. You're on the first page? Uh-huh. And at the top, at the top there, it says, to MJJ Productions, and, attention, Evie, personal and confidential. Uh-huh. Does that mean that Evie was actually the person that called this in? Not necessarily. Somebody could have called it in and then you would be dealing with Evie Tavashi at MJJ Productions, correct? Yes. So, in essence, from the records that you have before you, you do not have any idea who called in this request for tickets. Let me clarify. Most of the tickets, to my knowledge, were ordered or confirmed by Evie. I understand. Some of them were called in by other employees of MJJ Productions. Okay. But nothing was done without, typically, getting Evie's authorization. So theoretically, before this flight, before the tickets would actually issue on this flight, 
you would need to have Evie's confirmation, correct? Typically, yes. Maybe Narcisse, who also worked there, correct? I'm not sure if Narcisse is on the, she definitely is calling some things in. I'm not sure if she's a part of the approval process. But going back to my question originally, here, you cannot tell who actually called this in. In other words, somebody else, somebody else entirely different could have called it in? I'm going to object. Calls for speculation, your honor. Overruled. I cannot tell who called this in. All right, and then if you look at the airfare there, that's economy airfare, $1,180.50 per person, right? Yes. Does that tend to indicate to you that this was a flight that was scheduled at the last minute? I, I can't speculate on that. I think it was. I mean, my gut feeling is yes, but. All right. I don't know if it was called in last minute. Okay, I'm going to take that down for a moment. You know, it might have been contemporaneously, only because ticket fares are good for only, you know, for a 24-hour period per se. So the fare is only good for, for a certain time frame, and then it will move on. So. Now, you testified to some other documents as to who might have been. I'm sorry, you testified to other documents as to whose names were on particular tickets or potential tickets. You do not actually know who flew on a particular day, is that correct? I do not. And, of course, if you, if somebody booked flights independent of your agency, you would not know about those flights, is that correct? That is correct. Okay, I have no further questions. And I have the exhibits that were handed to me. I'm just going to leave them here. Mr. Dietz, are you familiar with the regulations that were put in place as a result of 9-11? Yes. And given the regulations that are in place as a result of 9-11, in your opinion, based upon your experience in the travel industry, that another person cannot travel on a ticket, that a person cannot travel on a ticket not issued to them without proof of identification? That's my understanding. Nothing further. No further questions. Thank you. You may step down. People call Jeff Schwartz, your honor. Come forward, please. When you get to the witness stand, please remain standing. Right here, sir. Stand up there. Face the clerk. Face the clerk and raise your right hand. She's right here. I do. Please be seated. State and spell your name for the record. Jeffrey Schwartz. J-E-F-F-R-E-Y-S-C-H-W-A-R-T-Z. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. Would you tell the jury, please, who you're employed with? My employer is Talk America. And what is Talk America? We're a C-Lite local and long-distance internet telephone provider. Are you here to testify today as their custodian of records? I am. May I approach the witness, your honor? Yes. I've placed in front of you exhibit 458, and I ask you if you recognize that document, and if you do, what is it, please? I do. It's subscriber information from a customer of Talk America, Jay Jackson. And does that exhibit 458 also contain toll records for the period of January, February and March of the year 2003? It does. Is the information contained within that exhibit material that is generated within the regular course and scope of the business of Talk America? It is. Okay. And is the material that is in there, the information that is in that exhibit, collected at or near the time of the individual toll calls? Yes, it is. And is it relied upon to conduct the business of Talk America? Yes, it is. Your Honor, we would offer 458 into evidence at this time. I just have a technical question. There's a different 458 that we were provided. Has that been withdrawn or? That was never identified. Never provided to the court? No. Oh, okay. I'm just now informed by counsel that what was provided to us was not provided to the court or marked. So. We used a different exhibit number for this. So based on that, I have no objection. It's admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. May I please have, input number four, your honor? Mr. Schwartz, I would just like to go to the first page of the toll records of that exhibit. I'm going to project a few items up onto the screen, 
and if you could please explain them to the jury once they're up there, okay? Okay. Let's begin with the headings in the columns entitled A, B, C, D, etc. And I'm just going to point with the laser. If you can speak next to that second mic, please, it would be more convenient for you, and everyone will be able to hear you. Could you tell the jury what's in this section, the first line, section A, please? That's a number where the call would originate from. Is that the number that corresponds to the subscriber? Yes, it does. The customer? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And is that a mobile phone number or is that a landline? That's a landline. Do you provide local service for that, or did you during the time period in question? We did not. Okay. What kind of service did you provide to that particular landline? We provided LD service only. And LD, for those of us who don't know. Long distance. Long distance service. What's in column B? Column B is where the call would have terminated. What does that mean? That means where the receiver would have been picked up on the other end. The number that was dialed by the person at the 9279 number? That's correct. Okay. Column C. Is that the date of the call? The date and the time. Do you know whether the timestamp is based on a particular time zone? It is on the time zone where the call originated from. So if the phone number is registered in Los Angeles, it's going to be in Pacific Coast time, correct? Correct. The next column seems to indicate a place. That is the origination column date. Okay. That is the origination which corresponds to the column A. Column E appears to be the state, obviously, correct? Correct. Correct? Correct. I'm sorry. And of course there's column H and column I. What is column H, please? Column H is actually the duration of the call, from the time the call is received until the call was terminated. So that's the actual time that the call lasted? Correct. And what is this over here, column I? That would be the time that the call was billed for. Okay. For example, in this column, H, on the second line, a 34-second call results in one minute worth of billing? Correct. That is correct. Common practice in the telecommunications industry. We've heard that, yes. I'd like to direct your attention, please, to the middle of this chart, if I may. Beginning with the entry on line 25. Okay. This would be the calling number, Mr. Jackson, correct? That would be the origination of the call for Mr. Jackson, correct? And this number here, 201-213-0763, is the number that was placed, or dialed by whoever was using this phone. Placed and terminated at that number, correct. Okay. And does this call on item number 24, excuse me, item number 25 indicate the call was a completed call? Yes. How can you tell that? By the duration of the call. Over here, the 632? That's correct. Which on the bill appears to be what, 7 minutes? What line are we looking at? 25? Yes, right where the pointer is. That's correct. Well, 6 minutes and 32 seconds. Build for 7 minutes. Okay. And that's how Singular bought a T&T. Okay. Here we go. Line number 27, same number, to Morristown, New Jersey? Correct. And that call lasted 15 seconds, correct? Correct. Now, is that a completed call, if it lasts 15.3 seconds? Yes. Any call. I'm sorry. Explain that, please. Well, any call that is entered into the record, if the call was not answered, if there was not an answer on the telephone, there wouldn't be a record for the call because the call would not have terminated. But once the call is received and answered, regardless of 1 second or 20 seconds, or as far as 10 minutes, there would be a record of the call. Okay. So does that mean that this call was either answered on the other end or it got forwarded to voicemail or something like that? Any one of those possibilities is possible, correct? Okay. And this 15 seconds also costs a minute, right? That is correct also. Going down the list to item number 28 on the left, same number was dialed to Morristown, New Jersey, at 11.53? That's correct. Is this military time? Yes. So the next call down here at 1,320 hours, that's actually 1.20 p.m., correct? That's also correct. And the 1.20 p.m. call lasted 1 minute and 8 seconds? 
and build for two minutes, if that's what you're asking, yes. Yes, it did. This is my favorite one right here. The next call appears to be the same number, is that correct, on line 30? Yes, that's correct. And that call was placed at 13.24, 1.24 in the afternoon, correct? Yes, that's correct. To Morristown, New Jersey, for a period of 2.4 seconds? That's correct. Immediately thereafter, at 1,334 hours, that number was called again, correct? That's correct. And that call lasted 3.1 seconds? That's also correct. And in total, that was 2 minutes, in telephone company time, right? That's also correct, yes. You can tell I enjoy this, huh? The remainder of these calls, at 1,539 hours, item 32, item 33 at 1,407 hours, item 34 at 2,036 hours, item 35 at 2043, and item 36 at 2048, were all to the same phone number in Morristown, New Jersey, right? That is correct. And they were all completed calls? That is correct also. Now, I believe I misspoke and called 1359-1539. So item 32 is actually a call placed at 1359 or nearly 2 o'clock in the afternoon, right? That's correct. Okay. Now, beginning with item 36, 37, excuse me, on February 16, 2003, at 407 in the afternoon, was a call placed to a phone number in Wyckoff, New Jersey? That's correct. And what does your record reflect that phone number to be? 201-847-7576. Now, you have no way of knowing whether the receiving phone call, excuse me, the number dialed is a cellular phone or a landline, correct? You could gather the information. I do not know. You could gather the information if you had to gather it. You could do that. By some kind of a cell site? Or a customer service record. You could request what we call a CSR, which would be a customer service record, for the receiving call. How long are those records kept? I believe a record should be kept for eight years, is what a telephone record is required to be kept, so. Okay. Would the subscriber information on this end of the phone call also tell you whether it's a cell phone or a landline? Yes, it could. Okay. Now. Beginning with item 37, and continuing down to item 41, there appear to be four, four calls in a row between 4 o'clock in the afternoon and approximately 10.23 the following day, February 17, to the same number in Wyckoff, New Jersey, is that correct? That's correct. And were those completed calls? Yes, they were. Proceeding to item 42, was a different number called on February 17 of 2003 at 11.24 in the morning? Yes. Different between 41 and 42 is what your, is the question. Yes. Yes, different. Is that the same phone number that was called on the 15th to Morristown, New Jersey? Yes, it is. Okay. And was that a completed phone call? Yes. And how long did that one last? Item 42? Yes, please. It looks like 17 minutes and 39 seconds, billed for 18 minutes probably. There you go. Okay. And the item right below 42 is 43. Right. Could you tell us about that phone call including the location and duration, please? It looks like it was 26 minutes and 15 seconds to Wyckoff, New Jersey. The 201-847-7576 number. Would you turn the page, please? Okay. I'm trying to get this up there. How about we just do it verbally? Items 45 through 48 excuse me, 45 through 47, are they all telephone calls placed from the Jackson residence, J. Jackson residence, to the 7,576 telephone number in Wyckoff, New Jersey? Yes, they are. And were they all completed phone calls? Yes, they were. And did they occur between February 18th of 2003 and February 19th of 2003? Yes, they did. Your Honor, I have no further questions of this witness. Mr. Schwartz, how are you? Pretty well. Good. I think you need to kind of list more towards that microphone, if you could. This one? Yes, please. The phone records that you just testified to are in the name of Jay Jackson, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. 
And there's a billing address in Los Angeles, is that correct? That's correct. Is this a land-based landline phone or is this a mobile phone? It's a land-based phone. Is it your understanding this is a residence phone? It is. Our company only provides LD service to residence phones. We don't provide any type of cellular service. So this particular phone number. Let me see if I can put one of these up here. Your Honor, with the court's permission, I'll put up page. I guess it's really just page one. I'll put up my copy of page one and see if this looks like your copy of page one of exhibit 458. That is. All right, so you can look at yours, because it's a little hard to read. Okay. But look up here first just so you can see what I'm pointing at. I'm going to point on the screen at a phone number up there. Is that the phone number that is associated with this account? Yes, it is. And the account is for Jay Jackson, correct? That's correct. Now, I'm going to ask you to tell us what the, well, let me ask. Your Honor, I need to ask for the actual phone number. It's up there. Is that all right if I do that? I don't want to. Yes, it was the other information that we were concerned about. The social security numbers, that kind of thing. That's fine. Thank you. I just want to make sure. Can you read that phone number from the exhibit? From your exhibit or my exhibit? You have the official exhibit. I'm putting up a copy. All right. Yes, I can. Please read it. 213-739-9279. All right. Now, your phone company provided service, provided long-distance service to that number. Is that correct? That's correct. Does that mean any time that the phone was picked up and a call was made on that telephone number ending in 9,279, any time the phone was picked up and a long-distance call was made, it would be automatically billed to your carrier? That's correct. Is there a way to bill it to some other carrier? No. All right, so I'm going to put up page 2 with the court's permission. And if you can look in the book there so you can actually read it. But I'll also help you to stay closer to the microphone, because we have that microphone issue here. These records start when? On page 1 is what we're talking about. Yeah, I mean the records you just. January 1st of 03. January 1st of 03. And these appear to be the comprehensive records for that period of time, is that correct? They are, correct. All right, now, do you know what carrier this customer, Jay Jackson, had for his regular telephone services? It would, probably, I don't know specifically, it would probably be Pac Bell. Pac Bell, okay. So if we had seen, for instance, on February 4th a Pac Bell record showing a call from this number to Reseda, two calls to Reseda on February 4th, they were logged in on the Pac Bell statement, those calls would not necessarily show up here, is that right? I'm not sure I understand your question. Well, let's do it this way. I'll just ask you to look at yours, because I can't read mine from the thing there. If you look at the entries, I'm going to put that page back up again, your honor, if I may. Now that I've seen it, I'll do it this way here. I'll just try to look at the particular entries here. If you look at the entries for, starting at the top, it starts with the 1st of January 03, correct? Correct. And it goes through the month of January. There is a total of 11 calls through January, correct? Well, no. I'm sorry, there's a total of 9 calls. It starts on line 3 and goes to line 11, correct? Right. And? January 20th 03 would be the last call in January. Okay, and then as far as your carrier is concerned, the next charge you have is on the 4th of February 03, correct? To Newport News, Virginia. That is a call to Newport News, Virginia. Talking about line 12, correct? Line 12. Correct. That's correct. And then on the 5th of February 03, there's a call to Naples, I suppose. I'm sorry. Yeah, Naples, Florida, correct. All right. Now, I'm going to show you exhibit 451, and I'm going to have to ask the clerk for that, if I may, please. Should be a book. May I inquire of the government to see if they have that book there, by any chance? We're looking for an exhibit 451, which is the Pack Bell Records. You don't have it there at the council table is what I was inquiring. I don't. It was released for us to redact per the court's instruction. I didn't bring it down with me. She couldn't hear what you said. I'm sorry, your honor. 
I took that per the court's instructions to redact. I haven't brought it back. Try to blame it on me, will you? Laughter. That's the book you have. Yes, it's one of several. Okay, may I confer with counsel? See if we can find a way around this? Yes, discussion held off the record at counsel table. Your Honor, with the stipulation of counsel, we'll use my copy and the one that was provided to me at 451, tab 6. It's already been received into evidence. And that's what we'll use in a second, if I may. All right, good. Okay, Mr. Schwartz, let me ask you, how long have you worked in the phone business? Nine years. And are you familiar with phone billing records in general? Yes, I am. And how many companies have you worked for in that period of time? Just one. Which one is that? Talk America. Has Talk America been in existence all that time? Yes, that's correct. Oh, okay, all right. I'm going to show you a phone record that has been admitted into evidence, which is 451, tab 6, and it's page 3 of tab 6. And this was, I think I can say for your benefit, to orient you, this was provided by a Pac Bell representative. And I'll put that up if I may, your honor. Yes. Now, this is, I'll let you take a look at that for a second and see if you can orient yourself and get a feel for that. That is. It looks like a phone bill. There you go. All right. And if you look in the upper left hand corner, the indication is that this phone bill pertains to this phone number, 213-739-9279. Okay. See that? Is that the phone number that's referred to on your exhibit 458, the Talk America exhibit that's in front of you? It is. I think you have to lean into the microphone. Yes, it is. Oh, that one works, too. All right, okay. And I guess what I was referring to is there are a couple of entries here for February the 4th at 6.11 p.m. and then 6.14 p.m., both four-minute calls to a number apparently in Reseda, and 818, number. And my question to you is, assuming this is the same telephone, why would there be two calls billed to Pacific Bell on that date and another long-distance call to, where did we say, Newport News billed to Talk America on the same date? Why would there be? Yeah. So you're asking why a long-distance call would show up on a local phone bill? Yes. I'm not familiar with the geography of California, but Reseda may be within the Lada, and it may not reflect as a long-distance call. Could you turn around and talk into the mic there, please? You said, I think everybody heard, but you said, within the Lada. Correct. And what is a Lada? I'm afraid to ask. For lack, I guess to, a layman term would be an area code or a geographic area in which the phone call would be billed in, so, do you want me to explain it or? Go ahead. A Lada is the area where the phone call, you'd be charged different rates when you went across a Lada. And once you cross a Lada, it would be considered a long distance call. All right, so your local phone bill might have a call that crosses a Lada but does not invoke your carrier's business? That's correct. All right, so if I then put 458 back up, and this is page 2, the calls that we've just referred to there are not inconsistent with your carrier providing service during that same period of time, is that right? No. Okay, thank you. I just have a couple of more questions here. And let me look at this first. Yes, all right, I'm going to put this up and we'll again try to orient ourselves. Okay, you're welcome to look at the actual exhibit in front of you, but I'm going to refer to line 17, 18, and 19 from February the 11th, 2003. Do you see those? I do. Okay, and your bill would reflect only outgoing calls, I suppose, unless somebody called collect, correct? Outgoing only, that's correct. So it appears on February the 11th, 2003, there were three outgoing calls to Santa Barbara, is that correct? That's correct. And those three calls were at 2,322 hours, which would be 22 minutes after 11 o'clock at night, correct? Correct. And the next, that's to one number. And then the other two calls are to the same number. I didn't say that correctly. The first call is to a, one number. And the second two calls are to the same number? The first one's to 2,300, and the second two are 2,724. And the second two were placed at 11.23 at night and 11.49 at night, correct? Yes. 
Let me have just one more second, if I may, your honor, please. All right, I have no further questions. No questions, your honor. See you, Lada. Call your next witness. Crystally Danko. I do. Please be seated. State and spell your name for the record. Crystally Danko. C R Y S T A L E E. Danko, D A N K O. Thank you. Good afternoon, Miss Danko. Good afternoon. I've placed in front of you Exhibit 454, correct? That's correct. Do you recognize that exhibit? Yes, I do. Have you had an opportunity to review it and its contents before you came to court today? Yes, I have. Can you tell the jury, please, what Exhibit 450? Five. Five is? Excuse me. Yes, these are Sprint cell phone records and landline records, including subscriber information and billing information. And are the contents of Exhibit 455 those which are regularly made in the course of your business? Yes, they are. Would you open up Exhibit 455 in the index, please? Yes, off the record discussion held at council table. Okay, just want to make sure we're all on the same page. With respect to Exhibit 455, did you compare the contents of the table of contents with the information contained in the corresponding tabs within the binder? Yes, I have. Okay. We're not on the same page. We're not on the same page, I'm sorry. There is no, there's no, there's no table of contents on this one. You can use mine. Okay, thank you. Let's see what you did here. You ready? Excuse me just one second. I'm sorry. That's okay. With respect to the information contained in tab number one, is that subscriber information for a firm listed in the table of contents? Yes, it is. Okay. And are there telephone numbers that your records show connected with that firm? Yes. And are they also on the table of contents? Yes, they are. Would you read those telephone numbers into the record, please? 702-362-5118, 702-222-2500-702-365-6940. If you would turn to tab 1 of your exhibit, and does the first page of the exhibit list the same name that is under subscriber name in the table of contents? Yes, it does. If you would turn to page 2, and what is page 2? It is listing information, listing address and names for the information on the front page. Do those names correspond to the 222-2500 number? Yes, they do. And is one of those names a David Legrand? Yes, it is. Would you please turn the page and go to the page marked 3 of 11? Are you there? Yes, I am. And on page 3 of 11 of what appears to be a February 21, 2003, phone bill, is there a list of telephone numbers which include the 362-5118 and 365-6940 numbers listed in the table of contents? Yes. Okay. And do all those telephone numbers belong to the firm of Hale Lane Peak Dennison and Howard? Yes, they do. If you would turn to tab 2, please. Now, does tab 2 contain the subscriber information for a business entitled, Garrigus and Garrigus? Yes, it does. And is there a telephone number on the table of contents which corresponds to the number you have on record for Garrigus and Garrigus? Yes. And what is that number? 213-864-2100. If you would turn to page 2, the second page, do you find an additional number for the business, Garrigus and Garrigus? Yes. And what is that number? 213-625-3900. Turning to tab number 3, does tab number 3 contain subscriber and billing information for one Vincent Amen? Yes, it does. Is there a cellular number associated with Mr. Amen in your subscriber records? Yes. And what is that number, please? 201-838-4345. If you would turn, please, to Exhibit No, excuse me, Tab 4 in Exhibit 455. Do you have in Tab 4 the subscriber information for one Frederick Mark Schaffel? Yes, I do. 
And do the numbers in the table of contents correspond to the subscriber information in your Sprint records? Yes, it does. Is there an additional telephone number in your subscriber information for Mr. Shaffle that is not on the table of contents? If you would look at page 1. Yes, there is. And what is that number? 818-876-0029. And can you tell if that is a cellular number or a landline? I cannot tell by these records. If you would turn briefly to exhibit number 5. Does exhibit 5 contain the subscriber information for a Maria Farshian? Yes, it does. F-A-R-S-H-C-H-I-A-N? Yes, it does. Okay. And does the tab number 5 also contain the toll records, excuse me, the billing for the period of January, February and March of 2003? Yes, it does. Are the records contained within Exhibit 455 records which Sprint regularly relies upon in the normal course and scope of their business? Yes, they are. Your Honor, we would offer 455 into evidence at this time, please. On these, we have the objection of relevance as to, in particular, some of the subscribers. It's the same objection that I made previously, that there's no foundation to show relevance. And I think the court. I'll admit them, subject, as I did the others, to the district attorney tying up the relevance. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. Your Honor, may I publish? Yes. Mrs. Danko, it's Mrs.? Yes. If you would please turn to the billing information for Fred Schaffel and find the page that corresponds to February 7th of 2003, please. Okay. Have you found it? Yes. Okay. Does the billing for February 7th of 2003 begin on page 8 of the February 21st bill? Yes. Okay. I'd like to talk to you about a code on your bills which is denoted as CW. Yes. Okay. Online, excuse me. On line number 194, there's a CW next to the date and timestamp of 1017 AM, entitled Incoming. Can you explain to us how an incoming call, what an incoming call on your system means, call waiting? Yes, our subscriber was on the phone. Either he had received an incoming call or he had made an outgoing call. Either way, he was on a phone call. And during that phone call, he received another call. And when he received that second call, he answered it. And that's what indicates here, an incoming call. And a CW over there is what indicates the call waiting was used. Okay. Now, after he received, he or she. Or she. After the call came in at 1017 AM, can you tell whether or not your subscriber stayed on the phone with the call immediately preceding? For one minute or less. Okay. How can you tell that? Our corporation bills in one-minute increments, and one minute is listed here next to the call waiting indicator. So this could have actually been a 2.4-second call? Yes. My question, however, is, if the caller was on the phone to this number at 10.16 a.m., and it lasted for six minutes, did this call actually interrupt this call? Yes, it does. Okay. So the entry 193, did that continue after the entry on 194? Yes, it did. If you could please turn to page 9, and I'd like you to begin at line 215. I'll project that. There appears to be the same call, excuse me, the same code here a number of times. CW and CW. That's correct. There's also this code right here. What does that mean, the 3W? The 3W indicates that a three-way call was initiated. And how does that work on your system? You would need to be on the phone call in the first place, just like the call waiting situation. In this situation, if you look at 2 to 7 at 3.13 p.m., there was an outgoing call. Our subscriber had made an outgoing call and was on the phone for approximately 14 minutes. During that time frame, at 3.22, our subscriber called out and conferenced in another number. Let me stop you for a minute. Where are you? Which line item? I'm on line 230. Would you look at line? Sorry. 218? That's kind of hard for you to see. How about line 217? Okay. Explain how that came about. Our customer had received a call, an incoming call, at 3, at 1.13 p.m., and that lasted for 7 minutes. During that call, they made a call out, 3 weighing into the 702, 222, 
number. Okay. Would you expect, in a three-way call, that when the user of Mr. Shaffle's phone dialed the 222-2520 number, that would show as an incoming call on their system, if they record such things? The receiver? Yes. Yes. Okay. I think I have no further questions. Thank you. Counsel? No questions, Your Honor. Good. You may step down. Thank you. Next witness. Our next witness is Ms. Jennifer Simmons. I do. Please be seated. State and spell your name for the record. Jennifer Simmons. J-E-N-N-I-F-E-R-S-I-M-M-O-N-S. Thank you. Good afternoon, Ms. Simmons. I'd like to hand you exhibit number 450 and ask if you recognize that, please. Yes. What is it? It's records of Nextel statements from Tavashi, Evi, MJJ Productions. These are records of Nextel Phone Company? Correct. Do you work for them? Yes, I do. For how long? Six years. And are you here today as their custodian of records? Yes. He's going to adjust your microphone. Oh. Are you familiar with the contents of Exhibit 450? Yes. And is there a three-page table of contents? Yes. Have you gone through the subscriber information, the corresponding telephone numbers that are listed out in that table of contents? Yes. And have you confirmed the accuracy of the entries on the table of contents? Yes. With respect to tab number one, does that contain account statements for the telephone numbers 310? 901, 7487 and 818, 402, 7087 for the billing period of February of 2003? Could you repeat the second number? The first one was correct. 818. Aha. Uh -huh. 402, 7087? Yes. Okay. I have the same question about those two phone numbers in tab number 2 and I ask if the contents of tab number two are the billing statements for the month of March for those two numbers? Yes. And the same question with respect to those telephone numbers and the April billing statement. Are those contained within tab number three? Yes. Is the bill address under tab number one, two and three you can look at tab one first, Evelyn Tavashi? Yes. MJJ Productions, P.O. Box 6034, Sherman Oaks, California. Yes. Is that the same on exhibits, excuse me, the bills on tabs 1, 2 and 3? Yes, they are. With respect to tab number 4, can you describe what is in that exhibit, please? This is a subscriber history, a description of each unit. It will show the unit's phone number, the username of that unit that's listed in our bill, the radio ID, and IMSI ID, which is for our network to identify each unit for billing purposes. A serial number, which is a SIM identification, which tells what piece of equipment it is, as well as the effective date of the activation, and if there was an expiration, meaning a cancellation of that unit, if it cancelled. It also includes the account number for the bill, the billing name, and the billing address. Are there a number of phones? Excuse me. Phone numbers registered to an Evelyn Tavashi. Yes. That are listed in the table of contents under tab number 4? Yes. Did you confirm that each one of those telephone numbers corresponds to the information in tab number 4? Yes. And with respect to the billing information, do all the bills appear to go to the address at P.O. Box 6034? Yes, they do. Sherman Oaks, California? Are some entitled, Ms. Evelyn Tavashi, Attention, MJJ Productions? Yes. And some are not, correct? Correct. But they're all going to the P.O. Box at 6034? Yes. I'd like you to turn, please, to tab number 5. Actually, there is no tab number 5 in this one. Oh, I'm sorry. That's all right. It's actually tab number 7. Does tab number 7 contain four additional phones registered to an Evelyn Tavashi? Yes. And are those phone numbers accurately printed on the table of contents on Exhibit 450? Yes. 
Are the billing statements attached for the February billing cycle of the year 2003? Yes. Okay. With respect to the final two tabs, number 8 and number 9, are the numbers listed in the table of contents and registered to an Evelyn Tavashi contained within the tabs 8 and 9 for the months of March and April of 2003? For 8 and 9, yes. And you confirmed both of those? Yes. Sections before you came to court? Uh huh. Now, with respect to the contents of Exhibit 450, are these all records which record the information contained at or near the time of each of the events recorded? Yes, yes. Nextel is just a wireless company, correct? Correct. And none of these telephones are landlines? Right, they are all wireless. Okay, and does Nextel rely on the information contained within Exhibit 450 in the regular course of their business? Yes, they do. We would offer Exhibit 450 into evidence. I have the same objection. All right, they're admitted. Subject to connection later. Thank you, Your Honor. I have no further questions. I have no questions, Your Honor. Thank you. Call your next witness. It's going to be Joe Corral. I do. Please be seated. State and spell your name for the record. Joe J. Corral Jr., C-O-R-R-A-L. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Corral. Afternoon. I'd like to show you Exhibit 457 and Exhibit 459, please. Do you recognize Exhibit 457? Yes, I do. And what is it, please? It's telephone records that were subpoenaed from Verizon. Do you work for Verizon? Yes, I do. For how long? Approximately 27 years. And are you here to testify as Verizon's custodian of records with respect to the California and I think it's New York records? Yes, I am. And are the New York records kept in Exhibit 459? Yes, they are. Okay. With respect to Exhibit 457, is there a table of contents with a number of entries corresponding to tabs in the exhibit? Yes, there is. Would you give us just a moment? Just one second, Your Honor, please. Why don't we take our break now? Go ahead, counsel. Thank you, Your Honor. Mr. Corral, we just started talking about the two exhibits in front of you. Why don't we start with the New York exhibit? Is that exhibit 459? Yes. And contained within that exhibit, is there subscriber information and toll records for Francesco Cassio? Yes. Does he have a billing address in New Jersey? Yes. Are the records contained in Exhibit 459 those kept within the normal course and scope of the business of Verizon? Yes, they are. And is the information contained within that exhibit gathered at or near the time of the event? Yes, they are. And does Verizon rely upon those records to conduct their business? Yes, we do. Your Honor, we would move 459 into evidence at this time. Same objection. I take it same ruling. Same ruling, yeah. I'll allow it with the proviso that it's connected up later. If you would please turn to Exhibit 457. Are those the records for Verizon California? Yes, they are. And with respect to the 10 numbers listed in the table of contents, are those landlines? Yes, they are. I didn't ask you, but is it a landline in Exhibit 459 as well? Yes, it is. Okay. And listed within Exhibit 457, is there a table of contents that lists five sections where the subscriber is the Neverland Ranch? Yes. Have you examined the exhibit and all of its contents prior to your testimony today? Yes, I have. And are the numbers listed for Neverland Ranch which are listed on the table of contents? Those telephone numbers appear on your records contained within tabs 1, 2, 3, 4 and 6. Do those numbers correspond to the information contained within those tabs? Yes, they do. Do your records show that the numbers listed for Neverland Ranch were active during the period of January through April of 2003, excuse me, through March of 2003? Yes, they do. So those phone lines were active during that period of time? 
yes. If you would turn your attention, please, to the contents of tab number 5. Is that subscriber and billing information for one Rudy Provencio? I'm sorry, could you repeat the question? Are the contents of tab number 5 the subscriber and billing information for Rudy Provencio? Yes. And is the corresponding telephone number for him 301-473-5702? Yes, it is. Okay. I'm going to show you some records, if you could please turn to page 22. May I publish, your honor? They're admitted, are they? Have these been? Oh, I'm sorry. The rest of the foundation. Are the contents of Exhibit 457 records which are kept within the ordinary course and scope of your business? Yes, they are. And are the entries recorded at or near the times of the events recorded? Yes. And are they records which Verizon regularly relies upon in the normal course of their business? Yes, they do. We'd make our proffer at this time, Your Honor. Are you asking that they be admitted? May we admit 457 in evidence at this time, Your Honor? Same objection. All right, same ruling. It's admitted. If you could turn to tab 4, page 22 at the bottom, if I could direct your attention to this section of the phone bill. And maybe give us a little interpretation of what all this means, this string of numbers and letters and numbers. Start right here where it says, 0204, if you could. Yes. It's a record of billable calls, and in this case, the first call on the very top shows the date, which would be 0204, or February 4th. The call that was made to would be Canoga Park, that's an abbreviation, Cano, in California. Okay. The time right after that is in military time, which would be 2234, which would convert to 1034 p.m. Okay. The numbers after that would be the number that was called, which would be 818-876. 0029. Okay. Is there a header column at the top of this? I'll focus on that so you can see that one more clearly. Yes. It basically states calls billed to 310-473-5702. And that corresponds to the subscriber's phone number, correct? Yes, it does. Now, this column up here that says, date, call, etc., that corresponds with the numbers down this, these columns here? Yes, they do. Okay, so when someone wants to read these records, if they want the phone number dialed, they go to the end of this block and count backwards to get to the area code, correct? Yes, or, on the very top, where it says, MPA, which basically is the area code, that's where you can start, and in this case it's 818. Okay, your honor, I have no further questions. Cross-examine? Your honor, I have no questions. Thank you. Call your next witness. We have no other witnesses, Judge. Those are all the witnesses for today? It is. To Mr. Sanger, do you want to go back and cross-examine? We've got some extra time. Laughter. To the jury, I'll see you tomorrow morning at 8.30. Counsel approach for just a moment. I want to talk to you about our schedule for a moment. To the jury, you can go ahead. Discussion held off the record at sidebar. All right, let me just put this on the record. We're going on the record. The court was just inquiring of counsel about the schedule tomorrow, and there's anticipated to be three witnesses tomorrow. Some will be outside the presence of the jury and some will be in the presence of the jury. Do you think it will be a full day tomorrow? Or what's your anticipation? I anticipate it will not be, your honor. But from there on, it will be. They can't hear you back there. Go ahead. And I anticipate it will not be a full day tomorrow. I anticipate on Monday and Tuesday we will complete our case, and we will go all the way through without a break until we finish. And then you now anticipate we'll complete the people's case Tuesday? I believe, depending on cross-examination, but we will not have any more breaks. We will have all our ducks in order for those two days. Then the court was addressing with counsel exhibits 809A and 810A, which are the transcripts for, 809A is the transcript for the CD tape of the phone conversation between Janet Arvizo Jackson and Frank. And 810A is the transcript of the tape, CD, made during the Los Angeles Protective Services interview. And they were previously accepted into evidence, 
and the courts pulling them from evidence and having them lodged as transcripts, which is the proper procedure when you file a transcript with the court. Unless the parties stipulate the transcript may go to the jury, the transcript doesn't go to the jury. So we're just correcting that. The other transcripts all were lodged properly, and those were the only two that we found that were taken into evidence. That's fine with us, Your Honor. Is there anything else to take up before we recess for the day? No, sir. No, Your Honor. All right, courts in recess.